I was seven years old when I first remember hearing the word cancer. I knew that it was something bad because my mom had to leave town suddenly, right before my sister's birthday. And if you know Tiandra, she does not miss birthdays. I knew that it was something serious and that I should be worried, and I was. Why was the word cancer being said in hushed tones? Why couldn't my grandma just take some medicine and get better? A few months after her surgery and chemotherapy treatments, I saw my grandmother and I told her confidently that I was going to find the cure for cancer. Because it's that simple, right? And to me, it was that simple. I was going to make the medicine that helped her and other cancer patients get better. Now we can fast forward 20 years, and I have not cured cancer. That's safe to say. But I have tried to keep my promise. I have conducted research developing targeted therapy for drug-resistant breast cancers. And I have a PhD in cancer biology. And some people would say that having these credentials make me a scientist. And I guess you're not entirely wrong. If having an advanced degree and being a trained researcher makes me a scientist, then I am one. I'm one of seven million scientists and engineers in the United States, making up about 5% of the workforce. But is being a trained researcher and having an advanced degree a requirement to be a scientist? Well, I think that depends on your definition of scientist. Scientist is actually a modern word. It was coined in 1833 by a science historian who wanted to describe Mary Somerville. Mary Somerville was a mathematician and an astronomer. And at the time when someone had those particular interests or any scientific interests, they were called a man of science. And being that Mary was not a man, it seemed that a new word needed to be created. So, simply put, scientists are people of science or people learned in science. Okay, so then what is science? And that tends to be a more complex question, and it really depends on who you ask. When I visit middle school classrooms, or elementary school classrooms, and I ask them what is science, I get a variety of answers. Oh, I know, it's the study of plants. No, no, it's the study of animals. You're all wrong, it's the study of planets. Okay, I got it better, it's the study of diseases. No, it's cells. No, it's something bigger, it's the environment. It's water systems. It's the study of energy. And they are all right. Science is an enterprise that encompasses a multitude of fields with a diverse range of inquiries. The British Science Council put together a definition of science that I, I particularly like because it's very simple. It says, science is the pursuit of knowledge and understanding of the natural and social world following a systematic methodology based on evidence. I love this definition. This means that science is simply asking questions, making observations, experimenting, and drawing conclusions about the world around us. And I think given this definition, we're all scientists. In fact, we're all born scientists. Has anyone observed a small child discovering something in the world for the first time? I have a two-year-old son, and he makes a scientific discovery almost every single day. And whether it's that gravity really does exist or that his voice echoes in certain spaces, he is making a discovery all the time. His current line of questions are about food. He wants to know what is edible. And he found out that rubber bands are not. And he also wants to know if it is edible, can it be used for something else? And he's decided that smoothies can also be used for paint. And while my husband and I do not agree with this conclusion, um, it doesn't matter. He is systematic on, in his approach. He repeats his actions over and over again until his understanding of the world advances. All children do this. We all did this. And I think we all continue to try to understand the world around us. So if science is really the pursuit of knowledge and understanding of our world, should it really be confined to 5% of our workforce? All people are capable of asking meaningful questions and making observations about the world. Shouldn't science be something that we all participate in? And if science advances through the questions that we ask, shouldn't a diverse group of people be asking these questions? Each of us have different experiences and perspectives shaped by where we were born, where we grew up, 
our families, our communities, our friends. And given these unique circumstances, we all have different questions that we are interested in asking. For me, it was whether there's a cure for cancer. And for you, it might be something different. All of our questions have the potential to advance understanding and make a contribution to our collective knowledge. Actually, one of the most significant scientific contributions in our country was made by a non-scientist. Smallpox was a virus that killed millions of people around the world. When it came to the United States in 1616, it was referred to as the great dying. They didn't know how it was transmitted, and there was no cure for it. One of the learned scientists at the time kept what he thought was a unicorn horn in a cabinet for protection. And most people just had their prayers. But this all changed in 1706 when a West African man was brought to our country named Omnisimus. When he was asked by a slave owner, have you ever had smallpox, his answer was yes and no. He said he was immune to the disease. He said, well, if someone in his country got smallpox, they would take healthy people, and people would take juice of the smallpox and cutty the skin and put in a drop. And what he was describing is a process called inoculation. That's when you expose someone healthy to a weakened virus to help them build immunity. And this was a huge advance in understanding. So in Boston in 1720s, when there was another smallpox ep epidemic, they did an experiment. They inoculated a few hundred people, and they saw that only 2% of those people died versus 15% from the wider population. And so after this, this process of inoculation and subsequently vaccination spread around the country and around the world. So Omnisimus, a man with no formal education and no advanced degree, made a scientific contribution that has, has saved an estimated 150 to 200 million lives in the last 40 years alone. And while we are no longer combating smallpox, there are still many scientific challenges that we face as a world today. There are other infectious diseases. There's problems with food security and water sanitation. We need to figure out how to reduce waste, how to find uh, renewable sources of energy, and there's also issues with climate change. And we still haven't found the cure for cancer. To truly solve these problems, we need a diverse group of people who can look at these problems from different experiences and perspectives and generate questions that will bring us truly viable options and truly viable solutions to these problems. It is not necessary for humanity to wait for a small group of trained scientists to tell us how to solve these problems. We can all think scientifically, ask questions, analyze, make observations, and make discoveries that will contribute to knowledge. But as a society, we have unconsciously internalized perceptions that have limited who we see as scientists. And this limited perspective happens at a young age. There's an experiment called the Draw a Scientist Experiment. It's been conducted for the last 50 years. And it's been done in elementary school students all the way to high school students. And they found that regardless of age, race, social and economic background, or even what country the students are from, they all draw scientists the same way. They draw them to look like white males. And I don't think any of us are particularly surprised by this finding, right? I think if we were given the opportunity, the majority of us also might draw these white men. And while we are not surprised, we should be worried about the consequences of our bias. Last summer, I worked with 15 middle school age girls, ranging from ages 11 to 14 years old. And during the first week of the academy that they were participating in, they were taught how to navigate the National Cancer Institute data portal, which has cancer patient information on it. And then the second week, they were asked to identify a question that was interesting to them, and then given the data that was available, make observations, analyze, and draw some conclusions. The quality of their work after these two weeks was phenomenal. Their findings such as, does gender affect survival in patients with kidney renal clear cell carcinoma, were identical to those found by researchers at top institutions. These are 12-year-old girls, not trained researchers. And most of them are minorities from local schools. And I believe that the reason that they were able to generate this meaningful work was that they were given an opportunity 
to ask questions that they were interested in, and then were given the time, the space, and the resources to answer these questions. How many of these girls do you think will become scientists? I, I don't have the answer to that question, but I do know that they need to reach their full potential. There is too much at stake for them not to. We cannot let barriers or misconceptions about what science is or what a scientist should be stop them from reaching their true potential. Whether many of them become scientists depends on what the steps that we take as a society to reimagine what scientists are and what they can be. Mae Jemison, the first black astronaut, female astronaut, said, we look at science as something very elite, which only a few people can learn. And that's just not true. You just have to start early and give kids a foundation. Kids live up or down to expectations. Science does not have to be an elite activity. It can be done by anyone with an interesting question that they want to ask. And if we want to bring about a future where the knowledge being generated by science reflects the beauty and diversity of humanity, then we need to start with our young people. And we can all start by asking our young people, especially women and underrepresented minorities, not what they want to be when they grow up, but about what questions they have about the world and what problems do they want to solve. And when they answer, we need to really listen to them and do whatever it takes for them to reach their high aspirations. It does not matter whether we're the person who helps them think through their ideas, whether we provide them with intellectual or material support. It doesn't matter whether we're the person who shows them a scientist that looks like them or affirms that they can be a scientist. What matters is that we all do something to unearth these gems. Thank you. <laughs>